very much uh, greeting for this invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to discuss with you this important syndrome E, which uh, because of the EIA I had the privilege to know and to work on it and to discuss with you this afternoon. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and an anthropologist, as you said, and I will discuss this point for, um, based on my work with Cambodian uh, survivor of the genocide. I will discuss this point from my background with Cambodian refugees surviving from the Cambodian genocide. A lot of them were survivor and victim, but some of them were perpetrators too. And I will try to discuss with you the main issue you introduced today. Um, since we're, before World War II, you know, um, the issue of perpetrators and mass murder had become a major scientific challenge. But before that, a large consensus uh, prevailed attributing values to mass murder, they were just monsters. Their high level of perversion was the main explanation of their atrocity. Well, you know that since World War II, we had completely abandoned this paradigm. Too many people were involved in mass murders, too many people that were just ordinary civilians before the war that never had the idea of hunting someone, hurting someone, and furthermore, killing neighbors. Even the simple witnesses could be suspected because nonetheless, they did nothing to stop the killing. But even in that terrible context, the killers, the witnesses, and the leaders were probably ordinary men before the killings. Since World War II, this question has given rise to different hypotheses to explain how ordinary men can become mass murderers. You give a piece of that this morning. The situationist perspective focused on the situation into which ordinary men were suddenly projected, ignoring potential psychological factors. Left and concept of atrocity producing situation applied to Vietnam veterans Browning, ordinary men, or Verzer, ordinary Germans, all try to explain how almost anyone could become a mass murderer in certain situations. Left and murders were quite different because he had to explain the fact that a regular soldier from a regular army used troops, which were not supposed to commit atrocities like rape, mass execution, killing of defenseless people, were in fact immersed into extraordinary situations that had new rules and new values. For Lifton, those men were not mass murderers. They were much more war victims than war criminals. And their terrible acts were a kind of normal reaction, normal reaction to an abnormal situation. It was not just an excuse, but also a way to distinguish these soldiers from other mass murderers, from all those that killed without any other reason than obeying order. Paradoxically, for Lifton, the killing by reaction in an extraordinary violent context were less morally puzzling than obeying orders. Browning and Welser were then observing radically different contexts. During the Holocaust, the killers were not frightened fighters. There were armed killed killers in front of defenseless people. In this case, the main conceptual framework is Milgram's obedience to authority. But the basement, the basement is that the situation is the only producer of the normality, quoting of course, of atrocity in reference to the context. This is the reason why it seems to be that Lifton, as well as Browning and Welser, share the same situation in conceptual framework to summarize. Anybody in one of the situation could have hacked the same way as this killer hacked, because the situation 
pull the triggers if you accept me to borrow your title. The point is that predictive factors are probably a most important issue. But in fact, their results are much more related to the theoretical paradigm than on empirical data. For example, within the situationist perspective, war, violence, authorized brutality, a threatening hierarchy in obedience are necessarily the main predictive factors. The second major hypothesis was psychodynamic at the time, but it belongs to the same situationist paradigm in regard to the issue of predictive factor. In fact, Freud tried to find predictive psychodynamic factor that would help to understand why some men or women were more than other able to become mass murderer, but rather that was not, make a mistake, that was not his point, but rather Freud was trying to discover the archaic instinct that would explain how ordinary men can regress to these very archaic states of psychological development. Freud's answer is therefore almost any ordinary man. Cruelty, atrocities, and so on would be expression of archaic repressing stint that war, extreme violence, or genocide could arose. In one of his last contribution, by Why War, it was a response to Albert Einstein, Freud reintroduced the deep instinct to complete his previous explanation published in 1918 in Reflection on War and Death. Here Freud is anticipated Anna Arendt's future idea of ordinary men. Atrocity is possible because atrocity is linked to this instinct. And this archaic instinct can re reappear in context of extreme violence, such as war or genocide. In this Freudian perspective, an ordinary man is nothing else than anybody, which means that everybody has a high potential for atrocity. So the predictive factors are much more connected to the situation that can liberate an archaic death instinct, then to individual psychology, which could be surprising in, in Freud's statement, insofar as everybody would have the potential that only circumstances can reveal. There are two major problems with those approach. The social situationist as well as the psychodynamic. First, they both stand from an indeterminate postulate and take for granted that normally this should not happen. That will be my point later when I will discuss your hypothesis. Second, the fact that so many people can be involved in mass murders, war, crimes, atrocities, and genocide cannot reduce the other fact that not all of them accept to kill defenseless people. And this is a crucial issue. It seems to me that Isaac has introduced a very new perspective that leads us to understand why, or should I say who, are those men or women which will become mass murderers. He is combining the situationist paradigm with the search for predictive clinical factors. That is to say, when the situation reveals through a pathological condition something that was unperceptible before. In this perspective, the mass murderers are not monsters, but from a clinical point of view, they are not more ordinary men. You show that has been, that being a mass murder has something to do with pathological condition. He reintroduced then the idea of that, that being a mass murderer is not the natural human fate distinct from the, death, the situation is paradigm. It's a quite refreshing idea, you know. Refreshing because it brings some kind of hope in this dramatic context. It emphasizes the fact that not all of us, not all of us, will become mass murderers. Not only because of the context, but also because specific but previously unpercible psychological characteristics are involved. 
The main idea is to reintroduce the notion of predictability without referring to the statistic paradigm. In Freud's perspective, mass murder and perversion is not the most prevalent combination. That's an important point in order to attribute a clinical meaning to this very unclear notion of ordinary man. In Freud's vocabulary, one could say, men are ordinary men as long as they are not yet involved in mass murdering. So if the syndrome E gives a relevant solution to the second problem I was referring to, namely the fact that not all ordinary men will not become mass murderers, the first problem stays unsolved. Most of the theoretical literature that tries to address the issue of mass murderers is rooted in the standpoint that being involved in mass killing is an abnormal human behavior. For example, it seems to me that Isaac has tried to take into account many different aspects, especially through the clinical criteria he has presented, but the standpoint remained the same. First, explaining the individual involvement in mass killing exclusively through the individual act of killing. And two, two, explaining the act of killing through the lack of a general mental faculty. Those faculties that naturally reject the act of killing. In other words, mass killers are supposed to be unable to access the emotion that an ordinary man would have felt in front of the assassination of innocent. From a neurobiologic point of view or from a psychological point of view, this issue is how the issue then become how to explain this lack of the supposed normal faculty. I won't say that those killings are normal behavior, no. But I, don't, I won't say too that they are abnormal behavior. I won't discuss either the hypothetical existence of this supposed faculty that would prevent men to kill other men. But rather, I will try to stand clear from this opposition in order to look back on the empirical data we already have on mass murderers, and especially through their own narratives. My first point is that from an empirical point of view, as I say, I'm an, I'm an anthropologist, so I like empirical data, it is obviously much more easy to kill people, especially thousands of defenseless people, than one would expect or hope. Millions of Jews during World War II, nearly two million of Cambodians under, under the Khmer Rouge regime, 800,000 Tutsi during the three months of the genocide, and so on. That is to say, from a technical point of view, there is no doubt how easy is it, it is to kill defenseless people. As long as you get the right and technical administration, it looks very easy. So in regard to mass killing, the question is probably less the act of killing itself than the full context of the killing, and especially the administration that allows and facilitates it. My second point, if one looks with attention to what mass murderers say about the killing, it is obviously that the question of the killing, of killing or not, was not a major issue for them. And you got many uh, notations about that this morning. As an anthropologist, but also as a clinician, I'm used to pay attention to what informant and patient says, and to the way they say it. When they say that it was not a major issue for them, that they didn't have nothing, they didn't have to think in terms of choice, that it was just their duty, I do believe them. As Lieutenant Kolek said during his trail in 1971 after the Millet massacre, when more than 400 people were killed by US troops in Vietnam, among the 400 killed, there was not any Viet Minh or Viet Cong fighters, there were only defenseless women, children, and old people. That day, 
say Lieutenant Corley. It was my job to kill the people of the village. I didn't have to ask any other question. When I say I believe them, this doesn't mean that I adopt a naive posture according to a kind of blind trust in what they say. Though I just want to follow their explanation and then see what it means in their own experience, through their own appreciation, what did they like? What did they hate? What did they want to avoid? What was the point they thought they could choose or not? My task is therefore to go as close as possible into the perpetrator's mind and to follow their own logic. I would like to illustrate that point with few issues from my few words with Cambodia. The first issue is the preservation of a high sense of moral value. They had to kill because that was the right things to do. During his train, the former S21 director, S21 was the extermination center in Phnom Penh when more than 15,000 Cambodians were tortured and killed. So Duj said, if the Khmer Rouge had win today, I would have been a hero instead of being an accused person. With a great sense of honor, honor and respect to his hierarchy, Duj added in his testimony in front of his judge, I didn't like the killing, no more than giving the order to kill. I didn't give the order to torture or to kill for pleasure. It was my duty, that's all. But I had to do it the best I could. Even with ordinary perpetrators, one can find the preservation of a sense of good and bad, of right and evil, of choice and obligation, but this sense doesn't go through the question of killing. Here, to kill was even not an issue, just the reason why they were there at the time. But if they can't say much things about the act of killing itself, for them it's a non-event. I can see with my little glasses. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I will go fast. They say many other things on which they had the power to discriminate between good and evil, the acceptable or not, and so on. As long as we accept to ask the question and stop just focusing on the only act of killing, most of them acknowledge that they don't like what they have done, not for moral reasons, but rather for technical reasons as it is usually physically hard to kill with a cutter or to cut the throat of a dozen, of dozen people a day. Like in this Cambodian perpetrator testimony, 30 years after the fact, for sure I would rather not have done that because I didn't like it. There is any pleasure in killing people. This is a hard job, very difficult. Most of the people that you hit shout before, shout before dying. Sometimes their blood cover your shirt or your pants. It smells terrible. And there's always a chief on your back ready to yell on you. And after a full day working that hard, you only get blisters on your hand. This is a quite realistic description of mass killing from perpetrator's point of view. For them, too, a killing field is just like hell, but not for the same reason as those we would expect. The second issue is related to the idea of choice, killing or not. In fact, there is many other situations or reasons involved in the killing than only moral position regarding the act of killing. For instance, there are many other reasons that can explain individual and collective choice, interest, to save his opposition, revenge, conviction, and so on, and very rarely to save his life or her life. It seems to me, as a Westerner, or just as a non-implicated observer, we would like to imagine that the act of killing is the most important choice, and in that case, while it is more or less wild, in that case, it is more or less just a consequence of previous choice. Too much things to lose, or not enough things to lose. The third issue, that would be the last one, is the administration of death. The large political organization that gives everyone a specific task is the killing machine. 
No one is doing every step of the killing process. From the arrest to the interview, the torture, and then the execution, different persons are involved. But anyway, each of them is clearly aware of the final outcome. In other words, each of them participate to the crime, and no one is the only killer. For them, perpetrators as well as officers, death is a process and not a specific act. When I gave the last hit with the cudgel, they were already dead long time ago, since the first day they entered in S21, say a former guard from S21. The work division is therefore an important factor for the understanding of how mass murders are so easily produced within a powerful death administration that rule as death factories, the different types of killing, with many death workers, the killers. For death workers, the act of killing is only one aspect of their job, sometimes the shortest, and then the less important in the opinion compared to all other tasks they have to accomplish all along the day. As they all say, it's a job like any other, with no specific joy, no pleasure, sometimes disgust or pain when the job is too hard, acceptable when it's sometimes possible to avoid the worst difficult task, but before all, very repetitive, each day the same task. So I will not agree on the rent idea of banality of evil. Because in that case, there is not even the idea of evil in perpetrators' minds, even not banality. Their job is not banal at all. Difficult, unpleasant for sure, but they do it. And sometimes they are proud of doing a very difficult job. This is not banal. When thousands of people, this is my conclusion, don't be afraid. When thousands of people are involved in the same behavior, when this behavior is a high level as a high level of legitimacy, wherein there is no risk of being accused, when the propaganda offers strong validation, then there might be, have many different singular reasons in expression, and not only one, that can explain in each case why someone has accepted to act the way he is act, and in that case decide to kill, like many others. Psychiatrists, psychologists, and neuroscience will probably help us to understand why so many different people with so many different psychological profiles will accept to participate to mass killing. And I'm sure this conference will bring new issues. But as I said, if the situation is perspective was not sufficient because not everybody will become mass murderer, the predictive psychiatric syndrome is not more sufficient because too many different people are involved, even if not everyone. In that sense, syndrome E is probably a first step and an important step. It might be relevant in some case, but it cannot resume all, even if it will be more reassuring for us. Thank you very much.